Our text today is from chapter 7 of the epistle to the Hebrews. For these many priests could not continue because of death, but Jesus liveth forever and has a permanent priesthood. I could tell that the man had been badly injured in the accident. I'm no medical doctor, but by the pallor of his skin you could see that he was sinking fast. The attending nurse said, I think we should send for a priest. Stepping forward, I volunteered, can I be of any help? I am a minister. The nurse looked me over for a long moment and said, I think we ought to send for a priest. But I am a priest. Even though I am a Protestant and a Lutheran and a pastor, I am a priest. Somebody who is to intercede for God's people, bear up their needs before the throne of grace, and proclaim the good news of God's love for them in Christ. That is what every real priest does. The idea has never been to give people a game plan for personal success in this world or to put smiles on the faces of unhappy people or to provide friendship for the friendless, or to replace feelings of inferiority with feelings of self-esteem. As desirable as all those things may be, a priest is to bring his people into the presence of God. That was the purpose of the Levitical priesthood in the Bible. The outstanding feature was that all the priests were descendants in the tribe of Levi. That law of heredity guaranteed that there would always be a steady supply of priests for the people. The Catholic Church of our day has a hierarchical or a pyramid system. From the people on the bottom up through the bishops and archbishops to the Pope on top. The Baptists believe that the local congregation is autonomous and independent. Our position is somewhere in between. But the question is not who has the best system? Whether a priest is a descendant of Levi, whether he is ordained by a bishop, selected by a pulpit committee, or just a name picked sight unseen off a slate of candidates presented to the congregation. The point is that God always had something better in mind, something far superior to any system. Only one priest did God ever anoint with an oath had to swear by himself because there wasn't anybody higher for him to swear by. The text tells us the Lord swear and cannot repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. God lowers himself to our way of thinking to underline what he has to say to us. My words you may not accept. You may question my motives. But my oath, you must believe. If I ever break a promise to you, I can no longer be God. My very nature would dissolve. 
you may have lost the sense of wonder in this whole wide world that I have given you. You may take for granted your physical health, your material blessings, the friends that I have placed at your side, all the laughter and the sunshine that I have built into your days. But you must believe my oath to you. I have given you my son, who is a priest forever. Now you can see the advantage here. All those priests could not continue in office because of death. But Jesus liveth forever. And therefore, he has a continuing priesthood. There's a touching story in the Bible about the death of the high priest Aaron. Aaron, his brother Moses, his son Eleazar, made their way up to the top of a nearby mountain in full view of all the people encamped below. The priestly vestments were taken off of Aaron. And they were placed upon his son. And there, in the setting sunlight, Aaron died. And there he was buried. One measure of the respect in which the people held Aaron was that they interrupted their homeward journey for 30 days to mourn for him. It wasn't just that Aaron was their first high priest. Aaron was the only high priest they had ever had. Aaron had been there at the start, back in Egypt, so many miles, so many years ago, Aaron was born in a slave's hut, stood at Moses' side during the ten terrible plagues, was with the people in all of the good and bad points of their homeward journey through the wilderness. Like an old family doctor years ago, Aaron knew everybody in the family, and everybody trusted him. Aaron understood their weaknesses because they were his weaknesses too. He knew their fears, their aspirations, their individual griefs and sorrows. It was Aaron's voice that encouraged them in the distressing hour and gave them guidance in the delicate problems of life. Now the old man was gone and a new one came along, but that bothered the people. Would the new man be like the old man? They didn't trust him yet. How could they? It was like starting your life all over again. When I first came here years ago, there was some consternation at the time about limiting the term of church officers. So letters were written to the experts on constitutional law and parliamentary procedure and they all wrote back and said, yes, limit the terms. And they gave several good reasons for doing so. Now, my heart, my head agrees with that logic. But my heart has never been convinced. A change always breaks the continuity. The continuity that comes from long years of sharing and bearing the burdens together. People who have lost a life's companion will tell you the same thing. 
or the guys working out in the shop when a new management takes over. It's like starting all over again when the flow of life is interrupted. Jesus lives forever. There are no interruptions, no gaps, no breaks in the continuity. Jesus was there to welcome you into this world, and he will be there to take your hand when you go into that world where you have never been before. And he is there for us in all of the changing seasons of life in between. From the springtime of childhood to the cold winter of old age. And therefore, therefore he is able to save to the uttermost those that will come to God through him. For he maketh intercession for them. The word save has been tossed about so frequently used it's like a worn out penny. Saving always implies danger. The greater the danger, the greater the saving. The one and only danger in your life and mine, is that we are separated from God. To refuse to walk in the light, stumble about in the darkness, that is separation from God. To lose our moral standards and call right, wrong, and evil good, that is to be separated from God. And when you see the shadow of death falling over every person and every effort and believe in the meaninglessness of life, that is separation from God. And when you find no more love in this world, love of home, of children, of friends, that is separation from God. And when we are lost in the original sense of the word, as a sheep far from the fold who cannot find its way back, lost as a little child in a shopping mall who's crying because he can't find his mother, lost as a sailor at sea without a star or a compass to guide him, that is separation from God. And from all these, Jesus came to save us. He came to save us from the persistent defeat of sin and the guilt and the garbage and the pollution from the past that we carry with us, the wrongdoing that cannot be undone, whether we admit to that or not. Jesus forgives us. But it is a forgiveness that satisfies God's judgment. Any other kind of forgiveness would not satisfy us or heal our wounds. I cannot accept a lenient, easygoing forgiveness. Forgiveness suffers, takes the hurt upon itself. And the Bible has it exactly right. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. There is also this. He maketh intercession for us. Jesus did not just save us and then forget about us but keeps right on pleading for us and interceding for us especially when you and I can no longer do it for ourselves. At night, for example, when you are sound asleep, utterly defenseless and unprotected, or in the delirium of a high fever, 
or at the end of the line when our minds falter and fail us. He intercedes. There's a beautiful picture of this in the gospel story read to you earlier today where the disciples are caught in a storm and Jesus is alone up there in the hills praying for them. And there they were. The waves rocking their ship. The spray stinging their eyes. The oars groaning in the locks. Their hands painfully blistered. Some of them terribly seasick. All of them losing hope. All of us have known times like that. They could not say the Lord's Prayer, sing a hymn, recite the Apostles' Creed together. But isn't that what crises and disasters always do to us? They take our attention off of God. And the daily demands upon your attention that drain your strength. Aren't there days in your life about the time you plug up a hole in your little boat, the water's coming in someplace else? And that is a disturbing fact for the Christian. I cannot be standing on my tiptoes and thinking about God all the time. The disciples were not thinking of Jesus, but he was thinking of them. They could not say their prayers. He was praying for them. I don't have to tell you what a tremendous comfort that is for us. That when our lives are a shambles and our faith is in disarray and our God long forgotten, he has not forgotten you. And there is this magnificent climax. Such a high priest became us. That means such a high priest meets our needs. Holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, made higher than the heavens, who needeth not daily, as those other priests, to offer up sacrifices first for his own sins, then for the people's sins. For this he did once when he offered up himself. There is not a priest on earth who can do for you what Jesus does or be to you all that Christ has been and is to you. Now, all due respect to the religious organizations of our day, the preachers and the teachers and the experts and the authorities and the psychological counselors and the emotional therapists and the self-help strategists. They can never do for you what Christ will do for you if you will give him half a chance. And we cannot expect of each other, uh, of these frail, sinful fellow human beings to be what they can never be unfailingly faithful, trustworthy, and permanent. If you have a place in the palm of God's hand, nothing can ever hurt you. Not loss, not loneliness, not disaster, not even death. Your God can and he has blessed anything. Trials, Tears, suffering, persecution, and even the wooden beams of the cross. 
But there is only one priest who can place you and keep you in the heart of God. Amen.